So what we're going to do, we're going to do what we call a close read. We've already done one. I know we've done one of these at least. And I thought we had done two, but maybe we didn't. I know we've done at least one. Okay. So we have, we're going to do a close read of this speech. This is actually probably the turning point in this entire play. This is where after Caesar has died and they're trying to determine just cause for his death. Okay. Um, Brutus is going to go against Antony in these speeches. And you have to determine what form of rhetoric are they using? What are they saying? And how are they convincing people to come their way? In order to do that, they do use rhetoric. And I don't know if you've heard of that term before, but it's called the art of persuasion. Okay? Rhetoric is the art of persuasion. There are three ways of looking at rhetoric when you're looking at when you're looking um, at this art. You've got it in a triangle. And up here, you need to write this down. Ethos, pathos, logos. Now it could it could switch logos could be on top sometimes and pathos could be on top. I don't know. This is how I've always done it though. Okay. Ethos is going to be your ethical. You're not going to go to a math teacher and ask him, unless he's really good at writing, how to put together an English essay. Vice versa, you're not going to come to this English teacher and ask her to do trigonometry for you to help you with your trig homework, are you? Why wouldn't you do that? Correct. I'm not meant, I haven't studied that in a long time. It's not something that I would have done, right? Okay. Um, and so that ethical aspect of it is where you get, like, they know what they're talking about. Okay. Pathos is going to the, be the emotional appeal. This one is probably the easiest one to find. This is going to be one where it hits right here in the heart. This is those little sad puppy dogs in the cage, give money to the shelter commercials that make you want to cry. Right? Okay? That's what they're using. They're using ethos to get you to give money to them. All right? And then logos is logical. Well, if you do your homework on time... It's only logical. You will most likely will have an A or get a good grade on it. Right? Yeah. That's logic. Okay? And and so that's what Logo says. He did this and so he gets that. It's where you get your cause and effect. Make sense? Okay. So this is called the art of rhetoric. This is called the rhetorical triangle. Hmm. Okay. The art of rhetoric means, boy, you can go in in one sentence and hit to hit an ethical appeal, an ethos appeal, and within the next couple sentences, you're hitting the heart and you're doing emotional appeal, and then you're going to end and put in a punch with that logical appeal, right? Okay. Mom, Dad, let me go to the party on Friday night. Please let me go to the party on Friday night. No, you can't go to the party on Friday night. But, Mom, so-and-so's parents will be there. It'll be okay. Parents are going to be watching and monitoring. Besides, you want me to be the most popular person in school, right? If I don't go, I am totally not going to be popular, right? And then we go into the logical, well, really, I won't get into any trouble, It'll be all right. I'm a good student. I'm a good student. I'm a good person. You can just see my grades. Do you see how that, how that kind of argument would go? Mm -hmm. That was a really crummy example, but you get the idea, right? Okay. So that's the art of rhetoric. So we're going to look and see how these two men battle it out with the art of rhetoric and how they affect the plebeians, the countrymen within the, within the um, audience, okay? We got it? I'm going to take this down so that I have more room to put out there for you guys on the screen.
Solid? Okay. All right. So be patient till the last. Here we have Brutus speaking. He's talking at, he's talking at Caesar's funeral. Romans, countrymen, lovers. What does he mean by lovers? Friends. What is he appealing to here? Huh? To pathos. You're my friend. Where does that hit? The heart. Okay. Romans, countrymen's, countrymen, lovers. And he actually hits all three of them because you've got the ethical part, ethos, and Romans. You want to be a Roman. Countrymen, you've got the logical part. We're all sitting here together. And then you've got the pathos part, don't you? All in one sentence. Kind of interesting, right? Okay. Hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear. Just let me talk for a few minutes. Don't say anything, okay? Believe me for mine honor and have respect to mine honor that you may believe. Censor me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge. Now we're appealing to this probably ethical part of this. Maybe path, maybe pathos. I'm hitting your pride right here that you are the better judge, okay? If I'm writing, you're writing, FYI, okay? If there be any in this assembly, dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus' love to Caesar was no less than his. How much does Brutus love Caesar? The same as Caesar loved himself and as everyone else loved Caesar, right? Mm -hmm. the yes, definitely taps into that pathos part of it, doesn't it? Yeah. And actually his love for Caesar was the same. as Caesar's love and the love of all men, right? Okay. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. This is probably one of the most important lines that Brutus says in the whole play. Not that I love Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. This is Logos. This is that logical appeal. I'm going to take down what destroys Rome. I'm not going to hit here in the heart. I'm going to take down what destroys Rome no matter what, because Rome is the most important. Does that make sense? Do you understand? Okay. Not that he loved Caesar any less, because I loved him the same as everybody else. I loved Rome more. And who was Rome? Who was Rome? Isn't it all the people of Rome? Isn't it everyone that lived there that he loved? Okay. Love for the greater good. Logos. This is logical. Did I tell you that? Or did I say ethos? I said logos, right? For some reason in my head I have ethos. But did I say logos? I did. Okay, good. This is logical, Okay. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves, that Caesar were dead to live as all free men? All right, so here we have cause and effect. Here's a swap of ideas. What happens if Caesar were living? Caesar were living. What would happen to the men of Rome? Would 
they all die what? Slaves. If Caesar lives, he's a tyrant. Every man is going to be a slave. Had Caesar, but now that Caesar is dead, now what? They live to be free. There's your cause and effect. And he's using again logos, isn't he? This is a logical appeal, isn't it? Okay. As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. Okay, so here's a term for you that you're going to need for the ACT. It's all over the ACT. This is called parallelism. Okay? This term, you will see it over and over again within readings. All right? Parallelism Let's look up. I want to give you the correct definition so I don't chop it to pieces. I want to make sure I do this correctly. So I'm going to look it up really quick in my resource book here. plates in here. Yeah, it is. Okay. All right, parallelism. It's when you join two ideas together in some form of grammatical construction so that they run in the same formatting to equal the same idea. It's the same ideas running in the same direction stated multiple times, okay? One of the most famous people in history taught using parallels, and that's Jesus Christ, if you look in the Bible. It's full of parallels, all right? So um, we're going to look at how he uses parallelism here. In the next four lines... Same idea stated over and over again using different words, okay? So we're going to look at we're going to look at them. Here's the first one. I'm going to change color on it so you can see it. As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. There's one. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. There's two. As he was valiant, I honor him. There's three. And then here's the other side of this. As he was ambitious, I slew him. There's four. These are all that cause and effect. This is what Caesar did. This is how I'm going to do it. When you're looking at, at it in literature formatting, notice that this is formatted the same way every time it's used. We have a comma here, we have a semicolon here. Comma, semicolon, comma, semicolon, comma, period. That's where he ended it. Does that make sense to you guys? You got it a little bit? See it? Yes? Okay. I didn't mess it up too bad. Okay, so here, for recording sake, comma, semicolon, comma, semicolon, comma, semicolon, comma. Here's where it ends, okay? It's that same structure that he uses in order to make a point using different words, 
okay? And in this, in this one, he's using cause and effect. He does this, I did this. He did this, I did this. He did this, I did this. But because he did this, I did that. Do you see? Okay, does that help? This is an, ex an example, a perfect example of what parallelism is, okay? You got it down? Okay. All right. There is tears for his love. Tell me where the next set of parallels are. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Can you, can you lab label them? Where's the first set of parallels here? Talk to me. First set of parallels. Tears for his love. Tears for his love. Second set. Joy for his fortune. Third set. Honor for his valor. Third set. Fourth set. Death for his ambition. Do you see it? And you see that structure, right? Comma, semicolon, comma, semicolon, comma, semicolon. That sentence doesn't end until that period hits. It doesn't end at a semicolon, does it, ever. Okay? Pay attention to that when you're looking for parallels within writings in the ACT. And it asks you to give an example of parallelism. Look at the way the sentences are structured. Okay? to give you help and guidance with that. Does that make sense? I will honestly tell you I didn't understand parallelism until I started teaching it because nobody ever explained it to me. I had to go research it to figure out what it was. Kind of crazy, right? But, I mean, it's really simple, okay? So now you've got really good examples of parallelism, and there may be more here. And he's using cause and effect here, which would then hit within... Logos, right? Logical, it's logical, All right? Okay, are we good with this one? Do you guys all have this down? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna pop this down and move the screen down, okay? All right, so We gotta go to who. All right, here we have, how is this affecting these people? All right, here we go. Who is here so base that would be bondsman? What is a bondsman? So low he would agree to be a slave, right? <coughs> okay, hang on, where did it go? There it is. I'm looking at that number two. Those little, those little guys are footnotes, and that tells you in the bottom that to look for that help and that information and use those. I mean, that's what they're there for. Slave, right? A bondsman. Who here is so base that would be a bondman? Base, stupid, <laughs> ignorant, right? If any speak for him, have I offended? I'm sorry if you think that I've offended you. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? Again, he's using parallelism a third time, isn't he? The structure is the same. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any speak for him, I have offended. I'm sorry if I've offended you. If you're not a Roman, I'm so sorry. Who is here so vile that will not love his country? If any speak for him, I have offended. I pause for a reply. I'm going to wait for you to tell me, have I offended you? If I offended you, I am truly heartfeltly sorry. Now he's hitting that pathos form, isn't he? He's like hitting right here in the heart, okay? Again, he hits parallelism. And hits the ego, making this a pathos issue. Okay. Are we good so far? Are you understanding it? Kind of interesting how he puts it together, isn't it? Okay. What do all the people say? What do they say? Not very smart. 
None, Brutus, none. Thank you, Joshua. So he says, none, Brutus. They all say, none, Brutus, none. We're all here with you. We're all listening. Are they following along? Like little lost sheep to the slaughter, right? They're following along, okay? Brutus then says, then none have I offended. I haven't offended any of you. None of you are so dumb. None of you are, are you're all Roman and you are all understanding. Yes, ma'am. Um, what does it say next to hit, hits the? Hits the ego, E-G-O. Hits your ego. Ego is really a, an inner instinctual thing. Like we really, that's, that's like base human thing. Okay. All right. So he says, then none have I offended. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. I haven't done anything to him that you wouldn't do to me. Okay. The question of his death is enrolled in the capital. His glory not extenuated wherein he was worthy, nor his offenses enforced for which he suffered death. He says, According to the capital, the question of his death is enrolled in the capital. It's basically, it's hidden there. Hidden in the capital. Why he had to die is hidden in the capital. He hasn't come out and done anything wrong to die for. He, he says that. Brutus says, yeah, you know, I have no proof. Okay. He was worthy, wherein he was worthy, nor his offenses in force for which he suffered death. He did nothing wrong to cause his death. But yet he's dead. Which leads the reader to question why. Enter Antony and others with Caesar's body. Here comes his body mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the commonwealth, as which of you shall not. Mark Antony, now that Caesar is dead, is going to benefit of Caesar's death because he inherits a place of the in the commonwealth okay he's no longer a servant of caesar's he is now his own man does that make sense mark antony is no longer going to be somebody to look down upon or call for duty like caesar used him for okay Here we go. With this I depart, that I slew my best lover, I slew my best friend, for the good of Rome. This is why he had to die. He already said that, okay? I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have that exact same dagger for myself when it shall please my country to need my death. In other words, you can kill me for the same reason I killed Caesar should I become a tyrant. Do you see? Should I become a tyrant? Kill me too. Don't allow me to become so overly zealous and overly powerful that I run things the way that they shouldn't be run.
And in the end, what do all the plebeians say? Live, Brutus, live, live, right? They all see his reasoning. They hit not only, he didn't really necessarily hit here, but he hit up here, didn't he? Big time. He hit up here. This is why it was done. You could see the cause of it happening. Think bigger, think broader. He hit that logical aspect of it when he was talking, didn't he? Okay. But he also kind of hit some of that path, pathos, didn't he? He hit some of that heart stuff going on. Okay, he hit the pride, definitely, of people. Let's take a look at what happens. You guys are doing really good today. Well, let's look at what he says in here, what it says in here. Let's see how well we did. This is the key that I got with my little kit here. You can't listen and speak at the same time. This is true. Be silent that you may hear. Yes, Brutus is flattering the commoners here. We did say that. Yes, Brutus was flattering the commoners. Here he says, any dear friend of Caesar's to him, I say Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than him. He means Antony's also speaking to the crowd, but he's really speaking to Antony. We were close, but it, wor it works the same way. All right. Not that I love Caesar less, but I love C Rome more. We got this one. Effective use of poetic technique, repetition, parallelism, and a good drama, dramatic twist. Okay. Um, the only thing that I, I did is I had you guys look at, make, find the parallelism here. But this is the logical fallacy. If you look over here on the side, right here, logical fallacy to question Brutus now means that I hate my country and prefer to be a slave. An unfair contra, con, construction. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman if any speak for him I have offended? Who is here so vile that not love his country if any speak have him I offended? I pause for a reply. He is quest to question Brutus now means that I hate my country and prefer to live a slave. So Brutus is saying that to people and that's kind of unfair, isn't it? It was unfair of him to do that, don't you think? Because if I say yes... I'm going to be a slave, right? Okay. I pause for apply drama. Brutus knows how to sway crowd. Silent consent. And then down here, he says, uh, there's no recording of Caesar's wrongdoing in the Capitol. There's no reason. And we did say that, yes. So Miss Arnie did okay without my key in front of me. Not too bad, you think? Good. All right, so at the bottom it says we all benefit from Caesar's death because none of us will be, will be a slave. Where is Brutus's proof that this was Caesar's intent? He even said there's no reason for me to have killed him. He didn't do anything wrong, right? Okay, and foreshadowing. There's one that we didn't do. You might want to go ahead and write this one down. This is kind of interesting. This idea of foreshadowing. What does foreshadowing mean? Anybody know that? It's like predicting something in the story before it actually has to happen. Yes. Do you think that something's going to happen to Brutus in the story? Oh. oh, yeah. He kills his best friend. What goes around comes around. Have you heard of that? Karma. Karma. Yes. Believe in karma. I have the same dagger for myself. When it shall please my country to need my death. I'm not sure if it's going to be that same dagger. I don't know. It's kind of interesting, that foreshadowing concept, isn't it? Okay, you learning something? I consider that a win, yes. Good? Okay, did you have something to say? Okay. All right, so let's take a look at the next page. Let's see what he continues. Antony, let's take a look at Antony. I will show you a clip from Men in Tights. Have you seen it? Robin Hood, Men in Tights. Countrymen, lend me your ears. And everybody takes off their ears and he goes, that's disgusting. <laughs> Every time I hear that line, that's what I think of. <laughs> Robin Hood says, he's like, that's just disgusting. <laughs> I'll have to show that to you guys. It's really funny. All right. So now we have Antony's speech, right? 
Anthony has a lot to say. Do you think Anthony's gonna nail Brutus to the wall? He marked every one of them for death, didn't he? Friends, Romans, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often interred with their bones. What does that line mean? What, is, what does this mean? The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. What do you think he's saying here? What do we remember the most of people? Think about it. Do you always remember the good days we have? No. What do we remember? bad feelings that get stuck in our head. And once you pass away, what do we remember? Unless their family mostly bad stuff. Unless their family mostly bad stuff. Amen. Super true. Unless you were really close to them and loved them, you often remember what was bad about them and not what was good. Right? Yeah. Okay, where does the good go? And how much good does one have to do to outweigh that bad? Well, if it's interred within their bones, where are their bones? Are they not buried in the ground? So it's buried with them, right? Mm -hmm. So the question then is asked, how much good outweighs the bad? What weighs heavier? <laughs> hundred times to one. It's that way with anything, you guys. If you look at the way, say, well, you guys are getting ready in the next five years to look at credit, okay? You look at credits, which works kind of like your grades. Here's a better one. Let's talk about your grades. We're not going to talk about credit right now. Grades are what you guys can work with, right? You know grades. You know when you turn stuff in, you've got good grades. How many grades does it take to take your grade from an F to an A? And how fast can your grade drop from an A to an F? Bam! Bottom line, one assignment, especially if a teacher doesn't get the grades in fast enough. And then suddenly that teacher's plugging in this major assignment. There's only four grades. You didn't do the assignment, and it, your grade hits the dust, doesn't it? And you're like, what the heck? So you don't do the assignment, but you do how many of these other smaller assignments to pull your grade back out of failing, how many grades does it take then? Oh, so many. You just want to fall on the ground, right? Yeah. That one bad grade killed your GPA. And, but 100 good ones doesn't bring it up very fast, does it? It's that way with anything in this life. I'm serious. Yes, Haley. I once had this therapist, and she's like, you can get a million compliments in a day, but one bad comment, you'll be thinking like that one all day. Yes. It works the same way. Because we focus on that negative so much, and a lot of that is self-talk. When you talk to yourself in a negative manner, and you do something negative to you, and then you hear it from outside, well, they're just confirming what you're saying to yourself. So how are you supposed to dig yourself out of that ditch? Does that make sense? Okay. It's the same thing, that same concept. All right. And he talks about it here, doesn't he? Caesar, Caesar was a human being. He wasn't perfect. We learned that in Act 1 when we did the close reading for that. 
whenever, whenever we, and I'm sure you guys probably don't recall, which is fine because we live and we go and this is a lot. But there was a part in there where Cassius is talking about Caesar being weak and how Cassius had to get into the river and pull, and pull Caesar out in his armor because Caesar was like, hey, Cassius, let's go into that river. Let's have a competition. We're going to swim over there. And I dare you to go do it with me. And so Cassius is like, sure, Caesar, let's jump in. They jump in together. The river's all roiling and it's crazy. And Caesar suddenly gets too tired because he's wearing his iron armor. And Cassius is like, I was the mighty Aeneas, and I'm going to throw him on my shoulders, lift him, and I carried him out of the river, and I saved his life. But then he got sick. But yet, Caesar wants me to bow at his feet, kiss his feet, and worship him like a god. Do you see? Okay. So Cassius was kind of salty there, right? Okay. Caesar was a man. He liked to challenge things. He liked to have conquests. He liked to destroy stuff. Not destroy stuff, but conquer stuff. Look at how he treated Pompey. Okay, or Pompey, whatever his name is. All right. <sighs> kind of interesting. He says, the evil that men do lives on after them. So the evil that Caesar did, it's going to live on after him. We're not going to remember a whole lot of the good. The good is going to be buried within his bones. So let it be with Caesar. Let it be with him because he's a man. The noble Brutus hath told you that Caesar was ambitious. If it, was, if it were so, it was a grievous fault. It was human error that he was ambitious. This ambition, human error. This means that he's a human being. Okay? Human quality, whatever you want to call it. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. He paid for it. He's dead. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. Oh, but at this point in time, I don't feel that he's being very serious about Brutus. What do you think? Sarcasm. I think he's got major sarcasm going. Is our... They truly honorable. Mm, I don't think so because I think he's like, it's really not honored just to kill a man for being a man. Right? Okay. Okay. He says, he says here, leave, uh, here, under leave of Brutus and the rest for Brutus is an honorable man and so are they, so are they all. All honorable men. Come, I speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. He was fair to me, and I, not only a friend, but a servant. Right? He was his right-hand man. He did things for Caesar. Okay? He was fair. All right? But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. Here's that repetition of honorable, isn't it? So now we've got a repetition here starting. We'll go ahead and end right here so you guys can stack chairs and stuff. Thank you for allowing me to get through so much material today. That was a lot, wasn't it? Yeah, but we did it. <laughs>